Two spacecraft met above Earth, moving at 7.6 kilometers per second. Their alignment was perfect. Velocity matched, rotation synchronized, approach rate measured in millimeters per second. No flames, no noise, no celebration. Just metal approaching metal in the quietest act of precision ever attempted by humankind. It was the first full-scale orbital propellant transfer between two starships, a system engineered to make interplanetary flight routine. Every test, every weld, every calculation pointed to success. But the moment contact occurred, a low vibration appeared in the data, a resonance deep in the structure, invisible to sensors until it began to interfere with the flow of propellant itself. Nothing broke, no explosion, no leak, no loss of signal. Yet afterward, the numbers refused to agree. Mass in did not equal mass out. Fuel vanished, not lost to space, but to the mathematics of precision itself. It was the smallest failure in the history of rocketry, and one of the most revealing. The orbital refueling interface was the core of SpaceX's interplanetary plan. Without it, Starship could never leave Earth orbit fully fueled. The design was deceptively simple. Two docking collars, each built into the nose of a Starship, meant to connect in vacuum with absolute precision. Each collar housed 12 mechanical latches, a capture ring, and two cryogenic fluid transfer ports, one for methane, one for oxygen. The transfer lines ran through the forward bulkhead into the main tanks, each controlled by independent pressure regulators and redundant vent valves. Docking was managed by autonomous navigation, LIDAR, optical sensors, and a cluster of cold gas thrusters providing pulses under 5 newtons. Approach velocity never exceeded 0.15 ms. Alignment tolerance, 3 mm lateral, 0.25 degree angular. Once soft capture occurred, hydraulic actuators extended to pull the collars into rigid connection. Then, and only then, the seals engaged. Fluoropolymer gaskets compressed to form an airtight joint. Their elasticity maintained even at 190 degree trous. Flexible internal lines extended, connecting tanker and receiver tanks into one continuous fluid circuit. Pressure equalization followed. Methane and oxygen lines were balanced through a shared manifold. Sensors measuring at 10 samples per second. When equilibrium stabilized, flow valves opened, cryogenic propellant began to move. The entire process took less than two minutes. Transfer lasted 45. During the test, methane flow averaged 7.3 kilgars, oxygen 12.5 kilgars. Temperature gradients across the seals held steady, a flawless run according to telemetry. But a small entry in the log caught an engineer's eye. Pressure oscillation amplitude 0.04 bar, frequency 1.4 hertz, flagged as expected vibration due to microthrust correction. Expected, logged, forgotten. Post-docking, mass telemetry was off by 132 kilograms, a discrepancy of 0.17%. Small enough to ignore, large enough to question. Over the next weeks, analysts searched for the missing mass. No leaks were visible in optical footage. Temperature data was nominal, yet the equation would not balance. The system had done everything right, and still something invisible had escaped. The anomaly resurfaced during the third transfer attempt. Mission code Orbit 29B. Same procedure, same alignment, same crewless control. At T plus 46 minutes, as oxygen flow reached peak rate, a sudden drop of 0.08 bar registered in the receiver's tank. It stabilized after 0.5 seconds. Automatic control ignored it. Later, the video feed showed a faint glitter, a flash of frozen vapor drifting from the connection point, instantly gone. At T plus 18 minutes, a minor correction burn rotated both starships by 0.8 degrees to stabilize alignment. That rotation changed the internal vector of liquid methane flow by less than a centimeter. But it altered the pressure field across the coupler seam enough to expose the crack to vacuum. The pressure wave from the pumps forced vapor through it, a jet invisible in darkness, expanding at 2800 mms. The leak rate, 0.005 kgs, negligible yet fatal in time. 
Inside mission control, tank pressure data showed only a gradual drop, 0.02 bar per hour, indistinguishable from temperature drift. No alarm sounded. Onboard sensors measured micro vibrations in the coupler, amplitude 0.7 millimeters, frequency 11.2 hertz. The same resonance now coupling the tank, the pump, and the frame. Three independent systems vibrating as one. Physics had found rhythm. Humans called it stability. The orbital refueling system still operates under extreme gradients, temperature differentials of hundreds of Kelvin, pressure ranges exceeding 5 MP, timing cycles measured in milliseconds. Each transfer is a precise gamble, balance maintained by control software that now intentionally avoids perfection, because perfection was what failed. The lesson was clear. The more a system resists entropy, the closer it comes to creating it. And nowhere is that truer than in orbit, where every molecule of fuel, every photon of heat, every vibration has nowhere to go but back into the machine that made it. SpaceX's innovation remains one of the greatest in the history of propulsion. It broke the tyranny of launch weight. It made deep space travel economically and technically feasible for the first time. Yet beneath that success remained the same constraint. Time delay cannot be engineered away. Light speed latency still separates systems in orbit. Symmetry still tempts designers. Every future refueling sequence must manage this invisible rhythm, the period between command and correction where instability grows. Orbital refueling transforms Starship into an interplanetary vehicle. But the first failure proved that the hardest problem wasn't plumbing, pressure, or metallurgy. It was synchronization, the unseen variable that connects control and collapse. Engineers learned to insert intentional delay, to desynchronize feedback, to make the system slightly imperfect, because imperfection absorbs energy. Every later success relied on that engineered imbalance. Still, the question remains. What happens when refueling involves not two ships, but 10? A full orbital depot transferring thousands of tons across multiple lines, each with its own internal pressure and thermal signature. The methane began oscillating, not visible to sensors, not audible through telemetry, a slow rhythmic expansion and contraction, 11 cycles per second. Every oscillation pushed on the coupling walls with 0.06 bar of alternating pressure, trivial, except that frequency matched the structural resonance of the coupler's titanium frame. The resonance continued for minutes. Metal flexed, stabilized, and flexed again. Each cycle removed microscopic particles from the inner weld, less than dust. It was cavitation without sound a vibration no algorithm flagged because it wasn't classified as risk. It was within tolerance. At T plus 34 minutes, tank telemetry showed minor pressure drift. Receiver tank up 0.4 bar, donor tank down 0.5 bar, expected from differential flow, cooling nominal, thermal gradient reduced by 0.1 K, stable again. The system appeared perfect, but the weld line inside the coupler had already lost 0.2 millimeter of thickness. Pressure margin had dropped 8%. None of it appeared on telemetry. The failure was progressing beneath data's resolution. When transfer ended, total mass moved. 1,289 metric tons. Mission declared success. Starship separated, performed deorbit burn, splashed down intact. The world celebrated, but the next mission, ORF-4, would start from that same hardware, now weakened by invisible fatigue. At T plus 3148, cameras on the receiver Starship recorded a faint, symmetrical halo of frost expanding from the coupler assembly. Area, 0.15 MT2. Engineers logged it as residual venting, no action taken. But for the first time, the two vehicles were no longer in structural equilibrium. The coupling joint had lost stiffness. Every maneuver now transferred stress directly through the leak. At T plus 3502, tank pressure fell below 4.9 bar. Automatic compensation engaged the backup pressurization line, forcing helium into the tank. That helium flowed through the fracture path, accelerating erosion from within. In under five seconds, the hole expanded to five million 
20 millimeter mirrors, the leak became a fountain, still invisible, still silent. The near miss came at T plus 3541. An automated stability check triggered a counter thrust from the receiver's attitude thrusters. For 1.8 seconds, one thruster plume passed within 30 centimeters of the leaking methane. Had the leak grown another millimeter, ignition temperature would have been reached. The system avoided combustion by a margin of 12 degree MIC. The distance between survival and destruction measured in the width of a credit card. By T plus 36 hours, the refueling process ended successfully. Fuel transfer complete. Both ships detached. Mission declared nominal. For four orbits, telemetry remained stable. Then the helium usage anomaly appeared. An unexpected consumption rate of Plygsejo 0.7% per hour. The investigation traced the consumption rate back to the leak. The weld failure began at 1.8 106 pressure cycles, below its rated fatigue limit. At cryogenic temperatures, the Inconel titanium interface contracted unevenly, 0.014% differential strain. That variance translated to an alternating stress of 12 MPA, unmonitored because the coupler sensors sampled at 500 Hertz, while the vibration occurred at 11.2 Hertz, outside the window of algorithmic focus. The system was blind to the rhythm of its own destruction. The full cascade was mapped as follows. Thermal drift introduced micro resonance at 11 Hertz. Cavitation erosion weakened the inner weld by 0.2 meter. Helium backflow exploited fatigue cracks. Differential stress widened the breach under pump reversal. Propellant jetting accelerated fatigue until structural collapse. No component exceeded its rated specification. The design performed perfectly. It failed because the model defining perfect omitted resonance as a function of duration. The failure was not mechanical. It was definitional. Post-analysis confirmed. The damage pattern aligned exactly with vibration data filtered out by telemetry compression. The algorithm that guaranteed clean readings had removed the truth. SpaceX engineers issued a single directive, always model resonance in the absence of gravity. The program survived. The next version of Starship integrated propellant management devices, fine mesh veins to separate liquid from vapor using surface tension. Sensors were upgraded to 100 Hertz sampling. Flow controllers hardened against cavitation spikes. By 2028, the system could transfer 1,000 tons of cryogenic propellant in orbit without loss. But the memory remained. A silent warning that even in vacuum, simplicity hides complexity. Orbital refueling had not failed. It had revealed the limit of predictability, the edge where equations end and behavior begins. Every tank now carries redundant temperature probes, phase separators, and damp transfer lines. Every simulation runs with stochastic perturbations, random disturbances representing the unknowable. And yet the question remains unanswered. As the entire Starship fleet relies on this maneuver, how do we model the cumulative effect of a hundred perfect failures? The system was stable, but not quiet. Inside the transfer line, vapor bubbles formed as cryogenic liquid met warm metal from docking friction. Each bubble collapsed as pressure equalized, producing micro-cavitation shockwaves at 1-200 meters s. The control software averaged these spikes out, classifying them as transient noise. They were not noise, they were signals. Engineers had relied on analytical models. Those models assumed pressure oscillations would dissipate through fluid inertia. In microgravity, that damping term vanished. What remained was resonance, self-sustaining vibration fed by the system's own control corrections. Every time attitude thrusters fired to counter drift, they added kinetic energy to the oscillation. Control algorithms reacted milliseconds too slowly, turning stability into feedback. When the two starships locked together, they became one mechanical body, a shared resonance cavity spanning 60 meters of structure and 50 tons of cryogen. Each molecule of methane moved in phase with metal. Each pulse of fluid reinforced structural vibration. The system had entered harmonic lock, not failure, not error, just physics repeating itself. 
That lock amplified the smallest imperfection, the asymmetry of seal compression, until it became measurable loss. In numerical form, the chain was clear. Flow velocity, 11.3 kilohertz MOS, cavitation threshold, 10.8 kilohertz, oscillation frequency, 1.4 hertz, seal temperature differential, 12 degree max, resultant pressure wave, plus 0.08 bar, each value inside tolerance, combined outside reality. Post-analysis teams proposed immediate mitigation, add flow restrictors to reduce local velocity, increase seal stiffness by 8%, introduce phase-shifted valve timing to desynchronize resonance. A new concept emerged, dynamic phase isolation. Small delays programmed into valve sequences to break harmonic feedback loops. The fix was simple, elegant, and ironic. It reintroduced imperfection, a deliberate irregularity to prevent precision from becoming instability. The next mission, ORF-03, succeeded without oscillation. Transfer completed in 27 minutes with less than 0.3% vapor entrainment. But the lesson persisted. Every success in aerospace is temporary, a truce between design and environment. Even perfect seals must flex. Even closed systems leak. If not fuel, then certainty. The engineers call it residual unknown. It means every parameter is known except the one that matters next. Future starships will refuel hundreds of kilometers above Earth, carrying life support, crew, and cargo for Mars. They will repeat the same silent maneuver, alignment, capture, seal, transfer. And each time, the system will perform exactly as designed until the next unseen variable appears. It may not be vibration. It may be thermal fatigue in a hose coupling, micro debris in a vent line, or molecular outgassing altering surface friction. Whatever it is, it will emerge not from error, but from precision. Because the more exact a system becomes, the fewer ways it can survive the unexpected. For now, the docking collars wait in darkness. Their surfaces gleam in sunlight, polished to mirror finish. Sensors sleep, lines are empty, but in the next test, when methane rushes again through frozen steel, the same forces will gather, flow, resonance, contraction. The same silent contest will begin between design and reality, and somewhere inside that connection, between pressure and vacuum, motion and stillness, physics will listen, it will measure, it will remember, the system will hold again until one day it doesn't. The echo of that 11 hertz vibration lingers in every tank, every pump, every orbit. It is the frequency of equilibrium, and equilibrium in aerospace is always temporary. Each starship that refuels in orbit now carries the legacy of ORF-4. Docking rings align, clamps engage, fluid transfer begins. Cameras watch the frost halos form and vanish, as expected. But deep inside the metal, resonance continues, quiet, contained, not dangerous yet. Telemetry records it as low-level noise. Engineers watch, waiting, never sure if it's the start of another cycle or just the memory of one because physics never ends where data does. It continues, repeating the same judgment across time, that every human calculation is temporary and every system is an argument with entropy. Refueling gave Starship infinite range, but it also gave energy infinite opportunity. The more we reuse, the more we ask the universe to forgive repetition. It never does. The anomaly remains archived under case ORF-4A, filed as non-critical harmonic coupling, a closed report, but the coupler's replacement still vibrates at 11 hertz every time methane flows, and perhaps one day that rhythm will align again, not as failure, but as reminder. Because in the silence of orbit, the line between progress and collapse is measured not in explosions, but in vibrations too small to hear. 